Hello, I'm Tony Hadland. There are few personalities in British cycling with the breadth and depth of experience of David Duffield. Among many other things, he's been a record-breaking tricyclist, the innovative marketing man who launched the Moulton and who popularised BMX in the UK, a cycle specifier for major manufacturers such as Peugeot, and a race commentator both on the street and on TV. At one time or another, during the second half of the 20th century, he's worked for the British Cycle Corporation, Alex Moulton, Rally, Halfords, Falcon, Pashley, Muddy Fox, various advertising agencies, and the satellite TV channel Eurosport, to name but a few. In March 1999, John Pinkerton and I visited David at his home, a delightful little cottage in Wiltshire. Our aim was to record his recollections of a very full and most interesting life in cycling. John asked the questions and started off by remarking that, in recent years, David has really made a name for himself as a TV commentator. This was David's reply. Well, first of all, John, um, I got into commentating from doing public announcing work. Uh, when mm -hmm. I was with Temple Press, I went out with a, a van and one day went to a veteran car rally and the man turned up and said, oh, good, the commentators have arrived, start now. Well, I only went out <laughs> to put up the banners and help them sell some newspapers and things. But um, so I got press ganged into it. Uh, and from then on, I got the groundwork of working as a public address commentator. It's a bit, I suppose, like being in films or television. Mm. If you started out on the boards, you know, actually with an audience in front of you, you get some feeling for the reaction to it. So that was invaluable to me uh, in that when I'm doing my commentary, I try to imagine like we're speaking here, that yes. I'm talking to somebody, not just talking down a tube. So um, it is quite onerous in that the pressure's on the commentators um, with the headphones on, you've got the producer in your ear telling you you're going to an ad break or telling you you're going to a cue break or telling you something that he wants to tell you in your ear about what's going to happen after the program wraps and this sort of thing. In the other ear you've got race radio coming in as well and your co-commentators coming down your cans likewise. So you've got all this noise in your head and then you're looking at the screen and you're trying to add to what you see so the preparation is enormous before you go on air. The interviews, the riders are getting mm. the paperwork together and it really is something which you accumulate over years. Yes. If you look at uh, many of the, the top commentators, they're not 23, 24, 25 year olds. You have to be at it a long time mm. because always you're prepared when things go wrong. I mean, anybody oh. can talk about when things are going well. <laughs> anybody can talk about a race when it's brilliant, when everything's happening, when Palantana is going down the road and Ulrich's after him, dead easy. But when you've got a stage and you're on air for an hour and a half, six men go down the road, they get caught 10 kilometres out and it's a bunch sprint finish and you've got on air for an hour and a half and that's all you see. Boy, you've got to work. Yeah. And of course, I think that you fill that, those odd gaps with talking about something that you're very fond of, which is food and drink. Yes. Um, I, again, I, f I fell into that in a rather strange way, mm -hmm. um, and I had to uh, relate David Saunders for this, really. He was a commentator on the milk race, or public announcer. We worked together, and David uh, asked me to go with him on some of the early milk races. In fact, I did 20 milk races, uh, and most of them working with David. We'd get to the stage finish, and David had a photographic memory, and he would say exactly what had happened in the race all the way through to the crowd that was there, blow by blow, everything. The race had finished, bang, and he may go off down the press room, and I had to stand there waiting for the tail end to come in. And Aberystwyth, when they come with the mountains, that could be like half an hour. Mm. So I found I would talk about the route they'd been through to put an extra side to it. I'd start to talk about things about the riders, what they did and what they ate and what we had. And this sort of other side of it developed because David had taken all the facts and figures off yeah. me. And yeah. so from then on, I, I continued to go down that route. And I've discovered uh, also from the letters I get that it, I know the audience is not cyclists, they're the minority of the audience. Right. People that That's watch right. Eurosport and many other television, Channel 4's coverage of Tour de France, for instance, they're getting two million people watching Channel 4. Mm. Those aren't cyclists. No. They may have ridden a bike at some time and they want to see more background. And I know some cyclists complain that Channel 4 only do 17 minutes of racing, but the other people want to know about the bikes, the background, the food, the massage, the vehicles and, mm. and places they've gone to of historic interest. And that's why I'm fortunate, because sometimes when I'm on air for two, four, even eight hours, it gives me time to explore these other angles and also to read out viewers' letters that they send in to me so they're all part of the programme. And that's I enjoy it that way. If it's just bike racing, it, I won't say get boring, but uh, I like the other dimension and fortunately the public like it too. Yeah, I think that, that, that some people have uh, unfairly compared what you do with the things that Phil Liggett does on Channel 4. But of course he's got virtually all day to prepare it. It's recorded so if he makes a mess of it he can start again. 
and he's got all sort of a backup team and there are people running with bits of information and the whole thing comes together and it's, it's a, a totally different sort of situation altogether isn't it? It is. Uh, Eurosport is, uh, we like live sport, the whole mm. attitude of Eurosport, if it's live we'll cover it which means we get warts and all because once the cameras start to roll we're on our way through. Right. We do some edited programmes sometimes but the majority of the cycling stuff I do is live mm. and I respect enormously what Phil and, and Paul Sherwin do. That cutting and shutting and trying to put it all together in a short space of time, we only got a few seconds here and a minute and 30 seconds there and two seconds here and a mm. minute and something, it's very difficult to put the flow in and we do an entirely different job, Phil and myself, and mm. I uh, prefer what I have to do, the live stuff, uh, much more than the other stuff. Um, and so we, we are not comparable in that respect, we've got a different job to do, yeah. but we admire each other, we work together and when we can't work uh, like he did a job uh, for Eurosport this year, to a Mediterranean, when I couldn't do it. I've done work for him when he can't do it. So there's no animosity between no, us no, at all. We, no. we're, we're terrific. We work as a pair. We meet up um, events all over the, uh, the world. And, um, but it's different, the work he has to do. You yourself have, have been riding a bike for how long? Oh, gosh. As a racing cycle, I didn't start until I came out of the army. And I'd be then in just coming up towards 21 mm -hmm. um, before I started actually joining the cycling club. Uh, I'd always been interested in, as, as kids are in bikes anyway. What was your first bike as a kid? Can you remember? Well, the first one that I do remember that my father bought during the war was a new Hudson with an all-bath gear case, sports light rose to with upturned North Road handlebars and, and cable brakes on it. And in fact, what happened progressively, I was at uh, Worcester Royal Grammar School at the time, I stripped off the um, uh, chain case because that was too, too heavy, yeah. and bit by bit I put drop handlebars on it, and so I transformed it into a sports bike. I used to ride seven miles to school and seven miles back every day mm -hmm. and think nothing of it. Then at Worcester Royal Grammar School, uh, sort of after was the King's Norton Grammar School, again I was riding about four miles to school and four miles back and we thought nothing of it in those days so I had this delight of cycling even as a schoolboy and um, I then got interested when I went to work for an advertising company called White Advertising just after I left school. I went there as a very junior artist in General Dog's Body and I'd go out to the clients and take artwork and I'd go to the block makers and um, art was something I could do naturally but I liked the advertising business and I went there, my father knew the people very well indeed and uh, we, amongst the magazines we had coming in was the cycling newspapers and magazines mm -hmm. and amongst our clients was um, the Coventry Eagle Cycle Company, Monitor Brakes, uh, yep. Bloomfield hubs and so I used to read this lot and so I got interested in cycling a little bit then uh, and then I had to go in the army and got called up national service and within a few weeks I was walking through the barracks and I saw this beautiful Hetchens curly stayed bike with these magnificent lugs and as a bit of an artist I thought that's magnificent never seen it yeah. like before beautiful and I handed down the, the owner a fat called Micah, a chap called Micah and we got to be very good friends and I discovered he'd ride from Litchfield to Worcester and then up to Malvern uh, each weekend and back again. Mm -hmm. So I um, thought I would like to do that and it's how these coincidences jump. I was yeah. standing on the side of the road thumbing a lift back to Birmingham as we all did in those days as squad. His mic had ridden his bike to Malvern, I was thumbing a lift. And his chap pulled up and stopped and I got in this little Ford Angler or something with the wings out the front, big headlights. Yeah. I looked in the back and there was a red frame on the back seat. Yeah. And I said, oh, I'm a bit interested in cycling. I'm thinking of getting a new frame because a friend and I are going to start cycling. And the man said, well, here's the catalogue. And so it was uh, Fred Parks' son. Oh, dear. Yes. <laughs> From Sun Cycle. Sun Cycles, yes. Yeah. And so Parks. I've got a coincidence. So I went, went to found a local cycle shop, which was Charlie Man's shop in Kings Norton, yeah. uh, ordered this FC Parks autograph, and I had it, and it turned up, and then I started to buy bits and started riding in the army with, with Mike. Um, then we went out to Italy, and I saw a bit of the tour of Italy out there, and I got quite fascinated by cycling and joined a club when I came out of the army, and that's how did, it started. Did your time in Italy, uh, and the, the bit of spare time that the army allowed you, did that have a big influence on your sort of attitude towards cycling? Because the, the Italians think about cycling quite a different way, don't um, they? Yes, they did, but we didn't get a lot of opportunity. I don't know, six months. And there were some, actually, the army cycling units provided bicycles to the, to, the, to the units. And we had these bicycles. In fact, that's <laughs> the first time I learned the tubular tie, if you don't stick them on, come off the rim, because I didn't stick them on. Um, and so we rode those bikes for a bit, but much more in the army. I was interested in basketball. I was doing a lot of basketball. I used to play for local um, uh, Italian basketball 
basketball team, and also I was quite a reasonable swimmer. And we were the the, the barracks we were on was at Mujer, right on the sea. And I was also one of the sort of rescue people in the sea. And I was mm -hmm. going swimming and water polo and that sort of thing. So cycling wasn't my number one thing. It was just something I did in connection with yeah. other sports. But I liked it seeing the flamboyance in inverted commas of the of the Tour of Italy, which came once to Trieste, and we went and saw it. And I did like that. Mm. You you were born at the time when a bicycle was an essential part of a young boy's kit, wasn't it? Because it yes. it meant that he didn't have to walk everywhere. Yes. Um, as a youngster, I went to the same school as you, Kings Norton, funnily enough, and it was two and a half miles to school and two and a half miles back. Um, and we used our bikes for everything. Yes. Uh, they weren't a leisure tool as they are no, today. So much so, actually, John. When um, I went eventually to work for Philip Cycles, that's another interesting story how I got there. But when I went to work for Philip Cycles, um, I was riding to and from Smethwick from, um, from Kings Norton, and that was about like, six, seven miles or so, backwards and forwards. And then I was called into the sales director's office. I'd only been there about six months, and they said, We want you to go out as a sales rep on the road. And I couldn't even drive. And here I was, 21 years of age. I hadn't even learned to drive. My father got a car, but mm. it never occurred to me that I should want to uh, to drive a car. And um, the same thing. We all went to and from school. You either went on the bus, on the bike, or you walked or something. Your parents never took you to school. No. You found your own way there, and we were That's better right. off for it, I think. Right. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So you you were at Phillips. Yes. Then, am I right in saying that they were first and foremost primarily? Uh, interested in um at the time you were there, providing bicycles for the, the masses rather than for the people with the money. Yes, it, interesting story about Phillips. Um, I, first of all, I was working at an advertising agency when I came out of the army, I went back there and I decided to um, spread my wings. I wanted to go to another agency to be a creative designer there and do all the layouts. And so I went to another small agency and I didn't see eye to eye with the studio manager. He was about five foot four and I was six foot four, so oh, well, that, that, more reasons than that. <laughs> Um, and so in the end he didn't like my work and I got fired and my father said no son of mine gets the sack and in those days it was like a criminal offence to get the yeah. sack and your parents didn't like it yeah. so I took it in, in good and went into Birmingham I'm interested in advertising I actually advertised myself in the Birmingham Post I put an ad in <laughs> <laughs> and um, the, the, the wife of the advertising manager at uh, Philip Cycles saw the ad and said, look, Arthur, you, you want somebody to help you right after this bloke. Now, I said nothing about cycling. I was only sort of half interested in cycling anyway. I mm. doing a bit of racing, but uh, not much. And uh, so he wrote, and I went to the interview and got the job. And the same time that I got the job, Brooke Saddles wrote to me and offered me a job there as well. And I'd applied for a job with Gem, not knowing what it was. Mm. So I had the choice. I went to Philip's and... That was in 1952, and it had, after the war, Philip Cycles um, moved into bicycle manufacture. Before that, they'd been just component manufacturers. Right. And in fact, 1952 <coughs> was their 50th anniversary, and they started out just making pedals. That was the first thing they did. Uh, and they decided after the war to go into complete bikes because they had the steel because they'd export to business, and went into complete bikes. And you're right, when I went there. The so-called sports bikes were, were a bit, um, you know, a bit heavy. Mm -hmm. uh, we just started making derailleur gears, thinking the Kingfish had our own derailleur gear on it, uh, and they were beginning to look at lightweight equipment too, and moving away from this bread and butter area. The old uh, um, yes, and um, so they were just beginning to move out of, um, of just the solid go-to and from work type bike. They got a very big range, even right down to the tricycles, little red night tricycles. So I remember those well. And I think there was one called the Silver Steed with a, a beautiful little sort of stylized boot to it, yes. a, a pointed rear boot. And yeah, that's, uh, the Gresham Flower People started that off, first of all, um, right. down in South Wales, and everybody followed in, yeah. in the industry. But that particular time, there wasn't a lot of innovation. All the bikes were straightforward diamond frame. You that's go right. to bike exhibition, uh, and I was in the advertising department, so I had to go to these exhibitions before I went out on the road as a rep. And you just look at the serried ranks of bicycles, and they all had the same diamond range, just as the frames got smaller and the wheels got smaller, and they went from the kids here with like 14 inch wheels, 16, 20, 24, 26, and the racing boys had 27, but the whole thing was diamond frame, and that was it, yeah. except for the ladies' loop frame. It really wasn't a rut. I've looked at the things that you've done, and it seems like you've got a seven year itch almost. Yes, I was there seven years, but it wasn't of my own volition to leave there. I first went to the advertising department, and then I went out as a rep on the road. Mm -hmm. uh, I was the youngest salesman they'd got. They'd 14 salesmen and most of them were all listened by my father and so I went out as a rep on the road for them mainly up in Manchester, um, Lancashire, uh, North Wales, Cheshire, Shropshire
culture, enjoy that tremendously. I started to feed back information from the field. I started to design colours and graphics for the bikes using my artistic background. Mm -hmm. So I found myself spending more and more time back in the office. And Armstrong was part of the group, the lightweight side, so they merged Armstrong in with the Phillips side, and I took over as product group manager of, of the Armstrong business. So it was another start to a slightly different career within the same company. And then, having merged the Armstrong business, the two advertising managers, McLaughlin of Hercules and Arthur Northwood at Phillips, were both getting towards retirement age. Mac had been tremendous. What he'd done for Hercules was unbelievable. We could spend all this tape talking about how he That's advertised enough. Hercules bicycles. Yeah. Uh, and the glorious story, I must tell you this one, uh, just before the war when Hercules were pushing their £3.19 and nine bicycle, he was sent down to London with £10,000 to spend advertising. In those days you went down to the media, you didn't do it through agencies, the agency did the artwork for you, but you went and booked it direct with the newspapers. And he went out and did the best deal he thought, and he came back to see Edmund Crane, before he saw Edmund Crane, he said, I've got all these, i booked this, I've done that, I've done this, and by the way I've saved you £1.30 or something, £1.15 and six or something. And Edmund Crane says, you go back on the train and spend the money, McClock, I told you to spend £10,000. And he sent him back to London to spend the difference. <laughs> it was really amazing. <laughs> no, but, so they were both well. going to retire, and um, I was going to take over on the advertising, all the advertising of the whole group, because by then we'd, we'd merged the manufacturing. Hercules were in our factory at uh, Downing Street, and Phillips were in there as well. We were making the Armstrong lightweight bikes there too. Brampton Fittings was just down the road. The right saddle business, which we also owned, was, was not far away. Uh, and so it was, it was coming together because the industry was declining in numbers. Right. People were go going on to uh, motor cars and motor bikes and things like that and, and the bike trade was declining tremendously uh, and so that was when you say seven year itch I didn't want to leave although it was declining there was still a lot to be done and the rationalization that was going on and we were hounding rally rally were losing money and we knew we got on you know, their backs so well they'd also take you no know, BSA and Sunbeam they already had all the Rudge the Humber all the other brands in there and so just these two big groups in in the UK British Cycle Corporation on one side that was TI on the other one so when I moved it wasn't that after seven years seven year itch the merger came about and I had the, the opportunity of going to Nottingham now in those days, you didn't get redundancy. Uh, you, if the company's merged or folded, you were out on your own, that was it. Mm. And we thought when TI, TI actually took over Rally, uh, and we probably thought, gosh, we've got it now, we've cracked it. After all these years competing against Rally, who, for instance, wouldn't put uh, derailleur gears on, they were still running Sturmy Arches for an awful long time after we were in derailleur gears, we were doing lightweight equipment, we were lightening our bicycles down, we were doing many more things to develop the product in a particular way. And there was Rally stick in the muds. Uh, so we thought, right, we'll now start running their business. But the reverse happened. TI gave the management to the Rally people. Mm. And they came um, and looked around uh, uh, Smethwick, and they offered only about six of us from the senior management, apart from the main board directors who are still running the op operation as it's merging. Of all the senior uh, management there, and even the clerks and everything else, I only offered six of us work in, in, uh, in Nottingham, and I was one of those six. Uh, and I went there, and they wanted to put me in the advertising department with no specific job. And I turned it down, you know, after being in competition for those years. So mm. it wasn't a seven-year itch. I went because... It just happened yeah, at that does. time. And coincidence again, I happened to be at the cycle show, um, and I'd met up with Reg, and he knew what was going on. And then he phoned me one day, and I told him I wasn't happy, because he was then working with Rally, uh, Reg. He wasn't happy either. Um, and he knew a fellow called Chris Lowe, who was the publicity manager at Temple Press, that published yes. 15 trade and technical magazines, including cycling. So just the time I was getting disillusioned, didn't want to go to Nottingham, Chris Lowe, who wanted an assistant, was speaking to Reg Harris, and Reg phones me up and Reg says, David, get down, I think there's a job for you in London. <laughs> so I went down there <laughs> for two years. Down on the train. Yeah, so it wasn't seven years, that was just, the, the merger yeah. came about and, and uh, we were um, put out, you know, only a few of us were given jobs. Yeah, so really despite your ability on a bicycle and a tricycle, most of your life, Dave, has been in promotion and promoting other people's products rather than sort of stuff that you've made yourself. Yeah, I'm a marketeer uh, yeah. and a salesman. Um, selling is part of marketing anyway. Uh, and that's been my upbringing. And in fact, what I do as a commentator, 
I'm inverted commas selling the sports right. people out there. Yeah. It's, 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 and uh, I, I've got to, I say, colour it and do things that aren't there. But I'm working in a somewhat similar way. And whether you're in uh, record breaking, whether you're marketing or whether you're in commentating, there's an element of risk in all these things. It's not predictable at all. It isn't like having two and two making four. Uh, it, all those three are unpredictable yeah. in their own way. And I like unpredictability. Uh, unpredictability. I also like being on my own and if you're in marketing you are often making decisions on your own it isn't always a group thing you may yeah. take information from people but when you make the decision boy it's your head on the block right. if you're going for a record attempt or you want to do something it's your decision and you're you're, you're exposed to everybody mm. when you're commentating there's only one voice they're listening to and if you make a mistake boy you're hammered so <laughs> there's not anything dissimilar about these three ways of no. earning a living except that most people probably find it a bit hectic <laughs> chronologically after the temple press thing mm -hmm. um, Alex Moulton, again coincidences, I happened to meet up with a chap called Roy Day, who at the, one of the RRA functions, he very quietly showed me a, a, a confidential photograph of his bicycle with small wheels that he'd stumbled across. He'd gone to Alex's house, to the hall, uh, when Alex had his open day, uh, on the, once a year he opens it up to people to go there. And Roy was wandering around and he saw this building which he recognised as being a drawing office because uh, uh, Roy was a draftsman. So he hightailed across, despite the sign saying, you know, private property, keep yeah, out, right. looks through the window and discovered this bicycle yeah. and Hightail back then to Alex Moulton. Now, Alex wasn't all that upset about um, Roy seeing the bike because that was a period when Raleigh was saying that they weren't going to make the bike and Alex was looking around for people who knew bits about bikes and Roy Dale, they lived in Canesham, had worked with BSA. Mm. So he uh, started to help Alex in the early days. He got in touch with me, Roy did, showed me this bicycle and he said he's looking for somebody to run this business. So I then met up with Alex and then I took off with Alex. So that was at Moulton, I was there about four years. Then I went to my and Baxter's for four years, so that makes eight, that's your seven year itch. <laughs> <laughs> and then after Marsh and Baxter, I finally, Rally finally got the net and cooked me. They're, um, they're making many changes to the company, they were decentralizing it, and um, so they got me to go to, to Marsh and Baxter, from Marsh and Baxter to Rally. I was there seven years, and then I moved on to, to, to Halfords. You say, what well, hadn't got the greatest reputation at that particular time for being the sort of you know involved with cycling as I had been. And my job, in fact, was to change that. Mm. Uh, when I went to Halfords, uh, the, what about 1980, no, 1977 or thereabouts, um, the, there was a move on the auto side to squeeze bikes out. Uh, yeah. Definitely. They were shoving upstairs, they weren't putting any downstairs, and uh, it had gone into a bit of a trough. Uh, they were Rally's biggest customer. They were selling over 200,000 bikes a year and only buying from Rally and from their own factory, Halmanco, which was making 50,000 bikes a year, Such and about a um, few thousand from uh, Arden Cycles were making a, a, a U framed or a, a 20 inch wheel bike for them, or straight frame 20 inch wheel, that's right. And I went there. and. I also took over all the, com the accessories business as well, which was a real dog's dinner. There were little things in little packets and, you know, all over the place and it wasn't well presented. So uh, I then started to revamp the range of uh, bicycles and to control the way in which it was operated in the stores and started to introduce new ideas and new things that got enthusiasm back into the organisation. Um, and as I'd come from Rally 2, I knew what Rally were up to, and so I was able to do certain things both in conjunction or separately from Rally. And certainly, one of the early things I did was to get involved in, in cycle sport, and particularly cyclocross, uh, because we, uh, the bikes at Halfords, 50% uh, of them were sold in the last three months of the year, amazingly enough. It, uh, mainly kids' bikes anyway. So I thought one place where we can attract publicity would be through Cyclocross, which for very little money you've got a lot of exposure. And in mm. fact, we, we even sponsored the World Cyclocross Championships, which got us a lot of exposure, sporting exposure. And it got the, the staff interested too, because we also had Cyclocross events we sponsored all over the country, and we invited the managers to the functions. So they actually come out and see something going on. We then got involved with Alan Rush with City Centre Cycle Racing, the same thing, uh, putting banners around the course and getting people to go there. And we, we hired Danny Clark just as a one-off rider for Halfords. See, I couldn't afford a team, a big team, but by, by looking at different ways of doing things, you can actually get a lot out if you really look and, and try just to be creative lighting. about it. Yes. So that helped transform, not totally transform, but it got the impetus going for, for, for Halfords. Um, and I was mainly interested in the, the workforce and getting everybody there behind it and the same thing with the people who made decisions on space allocation in the shops to get them to, to switch their thoughts too. 
So I had to do quite a lot on that respect, and particularly in the components where we had them all repackaged and, and, and laid out properly uh, and properly priced with proper profit margins and so on. Um, some people say excessive, but we had to make a few bob. And <laughs> I, in fact, was able uh, to increase the margins on the bikes and components, so we're ahead of what was happening on the auto side. And because it was something that they were almost would hope would go away, some of the people there, I was left very much to my own devices again. I ran it as a private fiefdom. And when I joined the company, it was 14% of the company's turnover, bikes and accessories. When I left, it was 28%. I doubled it as percent mm. of the company's turnover. Now, one may say the auto side should have grown and kept the 14% down. I wouldn't have mind that, but it just showed I could push it forward right. and, and do a lot of transforming. But the biggest transformation must have been BMX. We'd been selling uh, choppers and grifters and things like that. And uh, the, the grifter market wasn't uh, going up, it's been dropped down. I'd seen BMX. Um, and I went over to America to the New York Cycle Show, off my own bat actually, to investigate. And I needed something else. And I saw this as an opportunity and came back, did a report, and we started importing all the clothing from there. We built the first track at Redditch, first mm -hmm. public track. The Amoco people, uh, uh, Michael Jarvis, he'd built a track on some, uh, some private land he got, a small one. Uh, he'd been bringing mongoose bikes in. And one or two had been playing around with the top end stuff, but they had no tracks to race on. So we built the track at Redditch, and then uh, a fellow called Jeff Wiles, the next uh, pro champion, was just retiring from the sport. We put him on as our national consultant. He went round all the councils, helping them build tracks. Because I knew without the tracks, there'd be no BMX. That's right. And the cost of putting a track up wasn't that great once you showed them how to do it. So together with Alan Rushton again, who's helping with the publicity side and sorting out of a governing body, we drove the BMX thing forward. The first 12 months, we ploughed all the profit back into promotion. There was no profit taking the company at all. I just ploughed all back into promotion. Mm. And I used to go to meetings and people would say, ah, oh, how's BMX going, David? I said, it's going to take off. And it did. It took me about 18 months to make it take off. And it, uh, it transformed again the image of Halfords. Kids were going in with their pocket money to buy little things for their BMX bikes. We were getting sure. them into shops. The parents were going in with them to buy yeah. bicycles deliberately. So in that, John, of course, Halfords then went on to sponsor the ANC Halfords uh, um, racing team too. Mm. So it, it, it was an image building job. And look where they are now. I mean, they're yeah. about 20% of the UK cycle market. Something like that. Yeah. And, and when like I went that. there, there was people, in fact, some shops, they took bikes out. Mm. And we did two experiments like that, one in um, Aberdeen and one down in London. And uh, they, well, they found another shop, a temporary shop, and put the bikes in there and they took the space for auto parts. The bigger shop will sell more auto parts. The auto parts in both those shops never increased. The bike sales rocketed. So, so then they realised if we do the bike thing uh, yeah. even better, we'll sell more bikes. And then came the era of the big sheds. I actually left when they moved towards the big sheds. And that has transformed Halfords again by going out of the high street into sheds where you can put a good display of bikes on. And they're now a very professional uh, company. They've got a wide range of products. They're well respected by the people who've grown, grown up from BMX riders, now buy mountain bikes, or buying them for their kids who've yeah. got that image in their minds. So that was a um, marketing exercise, which, which I enjoyed. But the time, as ever, after seven years, you say, <laughs> was to go. <laughs> Just, just going back to your uh, first involvement with BMX, you said briefly that you sort of have to go on your own on your own bat. Would, would the company not pay? It? No, no the, those days only main board directors were allowed to go to to America, mm -hmm. and I'd been to one or two cycle shows, but it was like pulling teeth, you know, to get the money to go and do these things. Now I paid out my own pocket. I went down and flew by Laker on the cheap flight, booked my own hotel, paid all my expenses, and came back and presented to the the board my my findings. Uh, they, by then I had to explain where I'd been to, and um, they were they were fascinated, and um, so I broke them all there again because mm. nobody else at my level had been been on a trip like that. Now, of course, the, the buyers and marketing people from Halfords fly all over the world. Mm. Halfords, I believe, these days carry a lot of things that the smaller bike shops, which are having to concentrate on mountain bikes and the new gadgetry that's been reinvented for mountain bikes, don't carry anymore. So if you want some of the simpler things, you go to Halfords and, and get them. I mean, for instance, in Dumfries, if you want a 27 one a quarter tyre, you go down to Halfords because they've got them on the shelf yes, there, or yes. at least on the hook. Yes. So, although they don't carry the specialist market, uh, the specialist lines for the specialist cyclist who don't spend much money anyway, they're still looking after the masses of people, which I think is where cycling's got to go. 
you just now said that broke the mold. Now that immediately in my mind tells me Moulton. Let's let's talk a bit about Moulton because you were involved with uh, not quite with Hercules but with Phillips who through the British Cycle Corporation. Cycle Corporation yes. That was the combination that you were telling yes. us. That was the Phillips, Hercules, uh, Donald, uh, Armstrong, Abadale. Um, uh, uh, Abadale was sucked in as well. We never really used the brand very much. So, and Norman Cycles was part of the group, but they seemed to stay down in Ashford a lot longer. I can't remember what happened. I think they always got closed down rather mm. than the merged in. But our main brands were certainly Hercules, Phillips, Armstrong Sun? were the main brands. The Sun Cycle Company went to. It didn't go then, it must have gone later to Rally, because Rally yeah. became part of Sun Carlton. Uh, so, so there was there was this big group and, and yes. Rally. Now, I believe that when Alex was trying to find a manufacturer for his bike, he, did he try Hercules first? I don't know. I never caught up with that, because when I got involved with Alex, the, the, he'd um, d d fallen out or departed uh, the, the Rally operation. I know he went to Rally, but I don't know whether he spoke to Hercules first of all. Uh, I would have thought possibly, I only he can tell you that, but if mm. it had come into the British Cycle Operation that time when I was there, I would have been involved, because then it came uh, different. I had a look yeah. at it, and nobody ever spoke to me about it, which, unless he'd got some sort of uh, secrecy act going, I would have been sucked in to look at it, whereas Hercules or mm. Phillips in those days. Um, so I think he may have gone direct to Rally, but certainly yeah. you know, they said no. And again, they said no because they felt there wasn't a market for 200 bikes a week. That was the level at which the factory said they wouldn't tool up. Mm. And the first full year of production, we hit 800 a week average at Malta. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Did, didn't he come away from the show in 62 with an order book of something like 35,000 bikes or something? Well, no, it's, let, let, let me take you through what happened then, yeah. John, because yeah, obviously let's talk interesting about is perhaps it's breaking them all. As I say, Roy Day spotted this unusual bicycle, got in, he and I got talking about it, I went down and rode it. And there again, you see, you, you've got to ride bikes to, to feel them. and mm. to get, It's no good making a decision to sit around a table as a piece of merchandise. Yeah. You have to have people who understand bicycles. And companies that employ cyclists, I don't mean the dedicated bloke who can't see how to make a profit. I'm talking about cyclists or businessmen. C companies employ those sort of people prosper better than people who have no cyclists about the place. That's mm -hmm. a fact of life in the cycle industry. Um, so when I got to ride the bike, I felt this is great. And I really could feel that something there. Uh, and I didn't want to leave Temple Press. I was doing very well there. But um, it was too much of, you know, we back to Bradford Avon, lovely part of the world. Uh, and so I went down to Bradford Avon, start off with Alex. I'd already been doing some work to prepare for the cycle show while I was up in London because I had the three months uh, uh, period when I, before I could join Alex. So we prepared the ground. I, I was given the job of getting the stand organised, uh, all, the, all the publicity material organised. Alex went on uh, getting the bikes made. The, the early samples, I advise him on colours and graphics and specifications. Originally, if you're only looking at one bike, I was the one who said, no, you go for these different models to put a spread there, mm. otherwise people will think it's a, just, just one, one off, off and that's it, you see. Mm. And also the size of the stand, we agreed on what that would be, and he gave me a budget. In fact, I was over the budget by just 20 quid, which wasn't bad at the end by the time we finished. <laughs> but we set the stand up, and again, I wanted many things there, so it looked like a very professional country from day one. We had bump rigs, we had slides going, we had bikes that had been ridden across Iceland, we had a, a copy of the bike that Woodburn was going to rate, uh, attack the record on. So we made a really positive presentation of the, of the, of the show. And when we opened up on the, on the uh, Saturday, we'd already had a, a big expose in the, in, the, in the newspapers because we'd got Anthony Armstrong Jones appearing in the, the Sunday uh, paper, as it was then, Lord Snowden later, uh, riding one. And we had a big exposure. The Express came down, Ron Webb, bless his cotton socks, he came down, supposed to be for the Sunday Express. And the Sunday Exp the Express being what it was, broke the embargo, didn't they? And on the Friday, the proverbial hit the fan. There was this half page of this bicycle. And all the other journalists had come down. We'd been feeding them in one by one, because it was natural for PR. Alex knew so many people off the auto side. I knew a lot of the cycling people. We'd built up all the pub mm. publicity in advance, and the Express blew it. Uh, in no uncertain terms, and we had to dash up the tonight program and it's panic buttons. So by the time the show opened on the Saturday, we had people swarming in, you're right, wanting to buy the bikes, uh, giving us their names and addresses. It was just unbelievable. I was press going, any of my friends who'd come down to the show to help, we'd already got cars written out yeah. where they came from and everything else. So it wasn't much taking orders, it was taking names and addresses of people. We had people coming with checkbooks, wanting to write <laughs> the checks out there, and they're on the stand. <laughs> now this was on the Saturday. Sunday, uh, those days, the cycle show didn't operate on the Sunday, it, it uh, opened up on the Monday. And 
on the oh we had one cycle dealer come in late on Saturday from a local one he said uh, I've had a customer in my shop wants to buy one of those bikes uh, can I have one I said you're gonna have more than one I said because we're gonna sell you two can I have your name and address he said well I only want one for this customer I said go on I said we're not coming here now give us your name and address and you'll have one standard and one deluxe and you have to put one on display and one as a, one as a demonstrator oh, oh but it'll get soiled I said look you know this is what we're doing he didn't like that did he anyway he went away and <laughs> told his customer to be some weeks before the bikes came anyway um, on the Monday the cycle trade came in and there was our stand and you'd have thought round the stand we would got a, a moat full of piranha fish we were on the stand thinking they'd come in the deals going never sell wheels are too small never look at the price of, oh never sell <laughs> I'm not joking, John. I'm not I'm surprised. grabbing them and pulling them on the stand, people yeah. I knew. Yeah. And say, well, come on, you must be an agent. Look at all these. We've got stacks of inquiries. We've got boxes of inquiries. The phone. Those came in on Saturday. Yeah. And so, oh, well, um, I might have one. I said, look, you know, Van. so we started writing down names and addresses and telling what we're going to do. And one or two of the more thoughtful dealers agreed that, you know, what, what, what we And so it built up during that time. So the orders we came away with were the public. The dealers reluctantly, some of them would, 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 would go with the bike. Some did give us positive orders. Uh, and from then on, we had to start. Uh, I appointed Lloyd Binch, our first salesman, actually appointed him on the stand uh, there and then. And we started off going around all the dealers and uh, putting the bikes into the shops exactly as we said. They only had two, and they had to put one on display. And the interesting thing with the small wheels, I got this idea of the cardboard that was around the outside could be cut and you could wrap paper around it, hang it behind the bike because if you had it in with other bikes you couldn't see it because the wheels were too small amongst all the big bikes. Mm. So I got dealers to put solar windows displays on of the, of the stuff hanging behind the bike with all the features on it as well and that would be the ducks and the, the standard was for riding round as a demonstrator. Because I said unless they ride it people won't know what, how the springs work, they won't understand the bike. Uh, and again they oh it'll be second hand, I said you'll still be able to sell it for trade price, in fact it, it, it'll be premium price, people want these bikes. That's right. And, uh, and where the dealers didn't put the displays on, I sent the reps around. They, they actually decorated, did, they did the windows themselves to get the bikes in because the dealers weren't bothered. Uh, we really had to, you know, to work in certain areas. Some responded straight away and did a tremendous business. Um, and it just took off from there. Uh, we, you know, the first, I don't know, 18 months, two years, were just sheer bedlam. We had to have the bikes built up in um, uh, Kirby. With, uh, yes, at Kirby. Had the frames built at Fish and Ludlow near Wolverhampton. We just couldn't cope with the oars. Uh, Moulton doubled the size of his factory when we were actually at the show. British Motor Corporation then stepped in to help us. We just could not have met the, have met the quantities of what mm. we could see coming through. The dealers were reluctant, but the public were right behind Wanted us. Wanted them, yeah, yeah that's yeah, right. Yeah. It, Someone said to me on, at the cycle show just last week, and they're a youngish chap, they've learned about Moulton's through Tony Hadland's book, and um, they, have, they own Moulton's, and, and they asked me, he said, really what went wrong with Moulton, why hasn't he changed every bike to small wheels with suspension? And the only answer I could give him really was that the main problem was the resistance to change from, from the dealers. In fact, I knew a dealer who, to his dying day, proudly proclaimed that he'd never allowed a molten over the threshold of his shop. Yeah, yeah. Um, and this, this chap who was talking to me about it, he said, well, that's the only conclusion that I could come to, that you know, there was a resistance from the trade in general. Well, I think that's partly true. The, the way I see it, John, looking at it now, objectively, uh, all these years later, was that w we got the momentum going. Then, as with all products, you get a bell shape, starts going on the other mm -hmm. side um, from the early publicity. So then we went on television, the first company to go on television. We had a very simple little um, commercial made by Longley's and Hoffman's, a company that um, I eventually went to work for. And they did this lovely little uh, commercial, which actually won an award at Con at the uh, television festival down there. Uh, and we went round and we did presentations at the television studio, never been done before, pulled the dealers in, got them, mm. you know, uh, uh, reinvigorated, because when the winter came on we hadn't got a small um, a mini malt in those no, days, you, so, you the Christmas bike, no, so we had to restart it, and then of course got Alex to make the mini malt, and, although at the same time the Triangle were making a little malt version uh, for half of the license up in uh, up in the Midlands. So we, we, we then realised we had to sort of put this bike in there, then we would get the advertising, get it going in. So it, it then began to get a level, a, a business, and we were filling in with the various dealers where we found gaps on the maps. I sent the salesman out, and we quite right, we had to convince some dealers. In fact, Lloyd Binch's favourite trick was if there was a set of steps in the, in the uh, cycle shop, was to ride down the steps. 
<laughs> anyway, um, so we, we had to get to ride around the block, and it was really, I was like pulling teeth, but a lot of them support us very well indeed, mm -hmm. and there was a nice core business coming through. Then as we were getting established, it was going to be much more level business, whatever numbers it was settled down at, I don't know. Um, Rally came out with the RSW16. Now this is again the trouble. Out came the RSW16, which underpriced the Molten by a, about a five or six quid in those days, whatever it was, it quite a considerable amount of money, it underpriced it. Uh, we'd had a few technical problems too with the bike at that time. The, one of the things that the back forks had to be beefed up because they cracked and uh, because when you stretch in manufacturers and they were making by hand. We had one or two little uh, uh, problems. And so Rally promptly came in. Rally bring quality to small wheel bicycles, you know, and they had hammer this quality thing. That was the first thing they came out. Secondly, underpriced us. And thirdly, in those days, a lot of bikes were sold on hard purchase. We didn't have credit cards like we've got today. Mm. And Rally controlled the hard purchase business because yeah. uh, both the British Corporation and Rally had had their own hard purchase companies. They'd merged. And there was practically nobody doing hard purchase except the Rally hard purchase company. And they also had a lot of 100% Rally shops that only sold Rally brand bikes bicycles oh, and yeah. weren't allowed to sell anything else and so they had this dominance in the marketplace suddenly big advertising and they spent oh I spent all their years advertising budget on just this one RSW16 to catch up and because it was cheaper and because it's rally the dealers just started to pull shut sell it oh this is cheaper than that so look it's got small wheels it rides the same you can have it's cheaper it's also got dynamo hub and something and the dealers are selling down the dealers always sell the cheapest yeah. not always but majority of them think the easy way is to sell the cheapest so we were struggling then on this price basis not performance because it was much better performing bicycle i mean broken records on it done track things on it yeah and the, you couldn't race the eyes to with 16. So we were in competition with them, and it's pretty obvious to me then that they were going to smash us just by the sheer weight and size of the money. They wanted us out because we got right at their nose with the publicity, the position in the marketplace, the innovation, everything there. A number of people wanted us smashed at rally. And the fact that they turned it down as well. Yes. And so what happened then was this war. And uh, that's when I, going through this war, I, I left. Not that I was a coward and didn't want to fight the war. It's obvious that rally was going to suck mm -hmm. uh, Alex in. Okay. And eventually when they'd got it, uh, they, they put Ron Butler in charge of it, nice bloke, he'd been with Norman Cycles. They got some of the reps selling it, but there was no fire there any longer. Mm. I'm not being disrespectful to Ron, he didn't have the authority I had had, for instance, or um, um, Alan Lauterwasser or John Benjamin, or the rest of the people when we ran the business uh, for Alex. Um, he didn't have the, the sort of support in the same way. They took it on, just lowered it and lowered it, lowered it down, until in the end it was so small they just uh, flattened it. Mm. How do you find Alex as someone to work for? He's a hard taskmaster. He has to be to get where he's got to. Exactly. So you see what Alex has done. No ordinary bloke no. could have done that. If you've got a nice man who doesn't want to upset people, you don't get done what Alex no. has got done. Right. And if he ruffles up a few feathers occasionally, at least he gets the job done. Mm. And we wouldn't have the bikes we've got today if it hadn't been a man like Alex to do it. Not only did he do it once, but he did it twice, and now he's done it a third time. Yes, in yes, series. yes. He's he's uh, he's very active mentally and physically. Uh, obviously, he gets a bit fractious when things don't go the way he wants it because mm. he sees something he wants. It. He wants it tomorrow or today or yesterday. You know, yeah. And when he wants it, he wants it. Um, but well, you're quite right. He can be extremely pleasant one minute, and sometimes he gets a bit, you know, rough the other minute. But I've I've uh, learned to live with him over all these years. Um, we get on very well together. We're still very good friends. Mm. We we meet from time to time. Uh, I enjoy his company. We're entirely different people anyway, um, and I think I've got a great deal of respect for him on his engineering side and his invention. I think he respects my marketing side, so oh, he the does. two of us, we can add the two together yeah. no, and make a, 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 a formidable duo. But I still think the bike has got, uh, a, you see, the, the, the APB, which has come along, I act, that, had, that had to be rescued too. And one of my, when I became freelance, I used to have time in the winter to do consultancy work. Mm -hmm. And after the APB was put into uh, w, um, Pashley's, uh, the Pashley business went all over the place. They had a lot of financial problems for various reasons. And they neglected the APB. They just had these three black bikes. And again, it was the thinking, because uh, once Alex had designed it, it was up to them to market it and screw the bits onto it. And again, it's sort of old-fashioned bicycle thinking that there was this beautiful frame and they put cheap equipment onto it to make the price down. They were yeah. aiming for price points. Rather than saying, let's put the best equipment on because it's the best bike, yeah. they de it. 
and um, so my job was to bring the specification up and also particularly in respect to the wheels and tyres and rims to get the rolling a bit better and, and do many things there which I did and what's happened now since then it's again it's come on a quantum leap though the actual frame and everything hasn't changed at all no, still the same. and there's still more room to develop that bicycle and, and that is going on uh, but it, it's even out of steam it's more difficult to pick things back up again mm. and I still think the, um, the APB has got uh, another life and, and some more some more volume in it. Do you think that the fact that um, the APB now is, is branded as a Land Rover, do you think that's going to do them a lot of good or? It's been very successful because it's gone marketed to other people who've got off-road off 4x4s and just want a bicycle now mm. because we've got this mountain bike boom which has now come off down the other side and there are a lot of people now interested in cycling where it's you know just trundling around the lanes or whether it's going on a mountain bike or whether they're going on cycling holidays a lot of people are taking to cycling now like we haven't seen before work Sustrans are doing with the PARS is tremendous so people want to start riding bikes again and a lot of people don't want to ride the same bike everybody else has got they don't want a standard diamond frame and just looks like everybody else's bike that's why mountain bikes have been so popular because they've got all these gears and big tires and things you've trashed and, pedal and do all this like you know, it's, it's, it's a new thing you can mm. go to the golf club on this thing look what I've got so that's you've got true. a a, a Range Rover, you turn up, you take a Land Rover bike out the back, you only ride it five miles, at least it's different. You wouldn't find that yeah. man putting in an, you know, another sort of bike, for instance. No. So it's, it's helped, again, expose the brand. This is what you have to do in marketing. You have to be constantly doing something to promote it, uh, doing something new, doing a new um, component on something or changing it. it, it marketing always is about change. Mm. You, you have to find the time to change. So the Land Rover was a very useful bike at a very useful time. That will also begin to go down at some point. They'll have to find another one to put yeah. in behind it. And yes, so you, on. you've got to keep on finding the Yes, the stimulate new all the time. What's the thing that you want putting up on the wall when you shuffle off from this, uh, this life? Is, is there anything that you'd like to be remembered about, something that was really dynamic? I, I don't know. I've done so many things, actually, uh, over a period of time, which in, in their own, at that period of being you know, something I, I mm. look back and say that was good. I suppose it has to be launching the Moulton Bicycle and it has to be in parallel with BMX, funnily enough, mm. because both those products were things that people didn't think would take off, and, and they have done, and I think they've done a lot to the cycle industry. So those, those are two areas on the, on the marketing side that I look back and say, yeah, that, 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 I'm, I'm proud to be involved with them. Yeah, and that fits into the, the, your ideas about marketing, that you've got to have something new to sell. It's no good selling last year's model with a, a different transfer on it or a, a bit more chrome. Or well, a, that's a where, where when I came to the industry, you see, if you look at the old catalogues, as you look, from the, mm. the, the like 45, 46, after we're on to the, the, the 50s, all they were doing was coming out with a new colour. In fact, I was there when we went through into the flamboyance. One time they were flat colour into flamboyance. And then the graphics. And the graphics used to be done by the, uh, the, the transfer printers. Yeah. And they used to design them. And, and they used to just get artists doing them. They could be doing for, I don't know, box tops of chocolates I suppose or anything mm. so they do any old graphics and they weren't very good that's why I got involved in designing graphics to suit the bikes and the colours uh, and that's all we could do really was, was colours and graphics and just change some little bits of componentry. Mm. People go to a cycle show and look for great detail how the that's lug had right. been cut for this year's model and things <laughs> like that yeah. and nothing fundamentally changed yeah. and that's why the industry was in a trough it needed a, you know, a shake up which is what Alex did uh, and it to get all this new thinking going uh, marketing isn't just about shaking people up. It has to be a good product. If you oh, sell yeah. something that's, that's no good and you oversell it, boy, you're dead and you're, you're right down the pound. You have right. to believe in it. They'll remember right. that one. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Let's ask you about your, I was going to say cycling career, but you haven't been a professional, have you? No, I was going to take a professional licence to ride the um, uh, Parry Breast Parry race, mm -hmm. uh, which was held about once every 10 years or something. And just about to do it, the race was cancelled, so I never took out a pro license. But you see, I couldn't become a pro rider for a number of reasons. First of all, I was more interested in my job at all times. I didn't put cycling in front of my job. Mm. I rode as a tricyclist or racing cyclist on two wheels as and when I could fit it in with my, my, my job. Uh, because when I became interested in cycling, there were practically no British professionals racing over the continent. It was a bit of a closed shop over there. Mm. Uh, I also knew from the few road races I'd ridden that uh, I wasn't a very good climber, you know, at my height uh, and my weight. I just wasn't any good at the mountains. And, and most of the pictures I saw of cycle racing those days were these people struggling up the Alps and the Pyrenees, and I thought, that's not me. <laughs> don't, don't. Um, 
So I did get that opportunity. But looking back now, I realised that if I had taken the plunge and gone and ridden that single day classics, for instance, the one race I'd love to ridden would be the, the, uh, the Paris-Roubaix, for instance, because I did a lot of cyclocross riding. Mm. It's a course that suits strong men who are thick, <laughs> so, <laughs> prepared to ride hard, mainly on your own. Uh, but uh, no, I never turned pro. And, uh, and really, looking back, I don't regret it at all, because I got on and did other things. I think you've taken something like 12 records in the UK. Um, you told us earlier about cycling to and from school and, and your holidays, presumably, and that sort of thing. When did the when did the bug bite? Did you get into time trialing, or was the the sort of distance? I mean, just just tell me. Well, as I said, I met up this chap, Mike, up in the army, and um, we, we used to go youth hosting and riding around together. When we were up in Barna Castle. We did a bit of race, riding in uh, in Italy. When I came out. I just happened to be going in Charlie Man's shop in Kings Norton, and a fellow uh, came along and, um, and, and said, would I like to join this local cycling club, the Beacon? He said, you look a likely lad, because I wasn't in the club in those days. So I joined the Beacon, I'm still vice president of the club now, mm, after all sure. these years. And uh, so I joined, went along there, and they said, oh, would you like to race? And so I said, well, I suppose so. So they entered me in a, a medium gear Club 25, but at about two weeks' time. So I had to go and buy the, 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 the gear, no, I didn't get any <laughs> racing gear or anything. So I went off on this single fixed bike, uh, and uh, I fell off at the turn and I won first handicap. So I thought, well, I like this, <laughs> except the fall off bit. And then about, uh, I don't know, six weeks later, I didn't race again. Um, I wasn't that besotted by it. And I went to, uh, I rode the Worcester St. John's um, 25, because Mike Earp had got me interested in cycling, it was his event. And I finished ninth in that race, and full field, and got first handicap. So I was obviously set out to be a time trial, as mm -hmm. I thought at the time. Towards the end of that year, I did ride um, what we call mass start in Church Lawford in those days. Again, it was on the flat, so I was okay. And I was riding on high pressures, and uh, I don't know, it must have been a 10-speed gear. I actually got in the brake at the end, the, the brake that, that finally lasted to the finish. And about three laps to go, I was with people like Dickie Bowes and, and Johnny Perks and all that lot, and all internationals, and I was this big gangling fellow stuck in there. And uh, I was going well, and I punctured, and that was it. I think, looking back, if I'd done a lot more road racing, I might have been okay at that. But then, uh, when I, the following year, Philip Cycles asked me to become a salesman on the road, that put a stop to my training, put a stop to my racing. And from then on, I, I only fitted in the racing as and when I could find training time. Mm. And it was most of your work, most of your riding done with the Beacon, or did you go off with anybody else? I or? had a short period with the Greenford Club down in London when I lived in London mm. for two years because um, George Dixon organised some of my record attempts then, particularly the infamous um, uh, London to York, uh, where I knocked about an hour and 40 minutes on me off the previous record. And it, stood, on for, the tripod. And it, and it stood for 34 years. I had a falling wind, and I, I even broke the 100 mile record on the way up too, but we hadn't put in for that. I, I just went like stink, and that's, that, that was under Greenford colours uh, that I did that. You've now proved to yourself that riding a tricycle is enjoyable, and you found out that you can ride long distances, and by the sound of it, the further you go, the faster you get. Um, what was the progression of your, your other record-breaking uh, activities? Well, the, so the first one I went for the 100 mile record, which was found to be short afterwards, and at that point I thought, I'm not going for another record. But then having ridden this 24 hour, uh, and we looked at it, we said, well, why don't you go for the 1,000 mile record? Uh, and in fact, I've got the maps here of all the routes and everything else that we did, and, we, uh, and I went off to do 1,000 mile. And we did it actually, I said I'm normally racing best at the end of the year. What we decided to do was do it across the, the, the uh, Whitson Bank holiday. Mm -hmm. Because we looked at the time, and it was outside four days or something, that uh, the record at that particular point. So we, I set off from uh, Birmingham, from the Swan at Yardley, and down a course, right way down towards St Albans, up towards uh, Norwich, and turned back, and then went all over the place, up towards Chester, and out into Wales. And over the Whitson weekend, kept pummeling around this old tricycle. And I, I broke the record, not down a bit off it or something, if I remember correctly. And so, again, I was, it was good training for the year anyway. If, I, if I'd had a problem, uh, at least I'd got a few miles, and we looked at it that way, mm. you see. And I also rode very much on my own. I didn't have following cars. We just had checkers out along the way. So it was like a big training ride over <laughs> Whitson, a thousand miles. And I uh, <laughs> had a while, one hour sleep at my grandmother's place in Birmingham and another hour in Worcester, and that's all. And um, I, I, we also found, when we checked back, that I'd gone through the Land's End John O'Groats distance, 873 miles, faster than the Land's End John O'Groats record. Mm. So we thought, well, that, that's, you know, why not have a go for that sometime when I can get the training in? 
And uh, the difficulty was getting the training in, and the, the, the t opportunity came when the Suez crisis came about and, and petrol was rationed, and I was a rep on the road. And so I started riding around my customers on a bike because I used to mm. go up to Manchester on the train and ride around Manchester and, and, and Lancashire calling on the dealers on my bicycle. Yeah. Uh, I remember going out to North Wales on the train out to um, um, out Conway and riding back along the coast. So here I was early spring getting a lot of miles in. So again we thought, right, at Whitsum, let's go for the land in John O'Groats and start at John O'Groats. It had never been done before, I like to do different things, so I started yeah. in the north. And um, everybody warned me against it because you get headwinds on the way down. But That's at the right. early part of the year, sometimes sort of June, and I think that was a very late Whitsum, um, you can get anti-cyclones and you can get you know, calmer weather coming from the north or mm. no wind at all. And I set off about 8 o'clock at night from, um, from John O'Groats and rode down and, um, and got the record. Uh, so that again, you know, was, was this long distance thing became established. But to me, John, I think it must have been the year after that uh, when I came back to work at, at uh, Phillips uh, in, in the offices and I started riding again regularly to and from work that um, I went and broke the 50 mile record um, with the one hour 57 minutes. I got inside two hours. Uh, that's over 25 miles an hour on a tricycle, and this is going back a bit. If you see the weight of my trike and realize yeah. what it is like, I was I'd probably as proud of that as any of my long distance records mm. because it's the other end of the spectrum. We didn't have a 25 mile record in those days like they've got now. The 50 was the shortest, and to get the shortest and the longest I thought was, was quite interesting. That's right. Mm. But then you weren't satisfied with going from north to south against the headwind. And can I ask in that ride? Uh, I've, I've read the Alan Ray's book on the end-to-end -end record rides and almost all of them that broke the records had some sort of disaster during the ride. Did anything happen to you or was it a... a I'm talking about the North to South ride. I mean, North to South, interesting, because of the petrol fuel, it's all Suez crisis, uh, we couldn't plan to take vehicles up there. The whole objective was, I went up by train. I mm. booked into Birmingham Railway Station with my tricycle and bought a single and a to tricycle Wick. to Wick. And <laughs> <laughs> the chap was absolutely, never had a single tricycle a week before. So I went up there and the idea was, as I, as I rode down, we'd be accumulating enough uh, uh, coupons for the vehicles to pick me up further down south. Also, again, a bit like the 1,000 when I did that, if it all came and fell apart at the seams and I did have terrible headwinds and I couldn't manage to get down, then I could at least ride down to Birmingham training just just spend the time just coming down mm. with cancel the record attempt um, so off I set without a following vehicle and I had a really bad patch during the night because it was so cold up there I didn't realize the snow was still on the mountains mm. and I was riding through I got some uh, night clothing on but nothing like the clothing we have today and I was numb and cold and it got in my, my stomach and I was really ill got a lot of uh, I was being sick and all sorts so I rode through the night down into Inverness and rode up out of Inverness having had some breakfast with the nice people there and I was struggling and I thought this is it you know when I get down to Perth where the first vehicle is going to be I'm, that's it I'm going to take I'm going to pass it up and I'm going to I was Perth and knocking on the head and I was really struggling and in fact one time I was sitting on the side wheel spewing up in the hedge and I was awful <laughs> and then I got this is only like 150 miles away from the start and I came across John Arnold of all things a great tricycle he'd ridden all the way up to the top of this mountain somewhere in, in, in Scotland to, um, and he, he, he brewed up some tea and gave me something to eat and spoke to me like a long lost uncle and sent me on the way and you know I never looked back from that moment as mm. I thought I can't let John down I've got to keep going now and so gradually I got back into the schedule of things and rode down we had thunderstorms um, nothing I remember broke really um, I do remember getting down to Exeter and listening to the late Perry brothers talking from their broad you know southwest accent hardly understand the word they were saying and conflicting it with um, the, the, the the accent of the uh, people up in Scotland who I couldn't know what they were saying oh god yeah. it's interesting <laughs> going on there right all the way down to uh, uh, down to the finish and the fascinating thing coming back though was that when I got down there, um, Jack Wrightson and uh, uh, the timekeeper had uh, used my car from, from Gloucester down to uh, Land's End. And they got down Land's End about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of my club mates rode the last from Penzance behind me because the car went down to, to, to time me. Uh, I, I went down to Penzance into the loo, uh, down the steps to go to the toilet. As I came back out, I could hardly climb up the steps. I thought, you silly old bugger, you've got 10 miles to go and you can't get up these steps. They're <laughs> so sore, my legs. Yeah. Anyway, I got on the tripe, rode to the finish, and then we went back to this bed and breakfast place and I had a shower and got so all cleaned up. And we started to drive back to, to Gloucester. 
And now I've been riding for you know, two, two days and 20 hours, I think it was, and I'd only had a one hour sleep at, um, at Preston and about another hour sleep fell on down at Bridgewater. And the drive, going back, Jack Wrightson is falling asleep driving the car, and everybody else in the, in the car is asleep. Yeah. So I take over and I drive the car back to Gloucester, <laughs> and they're all asleep round about me. <laughs> well, you had the easy job, all you oh, had to do was ride the bike. Yes, yeah. The adrenaline was going, though, you know, that's yeah. what it was. Really. So, yeah, the little things go on, on, on the journey like that, but uh, otherwise, now you just get stuck in and just keep going. And then, of course, not being satisfied with doing it north to south, you then did it south to north. Yes, what happened, uh, within six weeks, Albert Crimes, who wouldn't attack the record because a fellow called Bert Parks had held it, and Bert Parks had got uh, Albert into, into tricycle racing, so he wouldn't attack it as long as Bert's record was there. But mm. Bert came and saw me at the finish, he, he came down part of the way on my record. So th then once I'd broken, he went the other way, and he, he set off about six weeks after I did, and knocked a something great lump out of it uh, with a good following wind, and Albert did a very respectful ride indeed. So once he'd done that, with which he got the Midlake Memorial Prize, and I didn't, <laughs> except I've got mine since for commentating. Yeah. <laughs> um, th th I said, right, I'll look for an opportunity when I get it back again. And of course, after the Suez thing, then I went back to work on the road. And then after that, I came back to uh, Phillips and I was able to put the 12 months training in, in fact, more than that, 18 months training in, uh, and had another go for it from, from, from the uh, south to north the next time around, which is the logical way to go in some respects. But there again, it's illogical because the further north you go, the colder it becomes, That's and right. therefore you're using your body. And also, the hills, I think, are uh, easier from the from the north. For now, I think the slopes are easier from the north. And the other thing, which yeah. which is a, a lot of racing cyclists don't realise who go for the end to end, is that uh, when you go through Gretna Green and start to go up into Scotland, you only just over halfway. That's right. And you when you go through Scotland, the, and it's in the night, and there's nobody out there, and you're going, and it's cold, and it's miserable, and and you know, the, it's maybe a pouring with rain, and you're dead mm. tired, and there's nobody to shout to. But this, as you come south, people turn out yeah. all the way through. So psychologically, in many ways, north to south is, I think, very good. But you and you. Could you do get very good straight winds coming down if you get them, but um, nobody else had to go that way around, so I'm the only bloke that's done it. Mm. And was your second ride better than the first ride? Obviously in terms of time it was a lot lot faster, uh, two days, ten hours and fifty-eight mm, I minutes. Wasn't, I was thinking yeah. about you, you, your personal well-being. Personal, yeah. Well, this time I also, having been talking to Professor Hamley at uh, Birmingham University, um, he had earlier electrocardiograph things, sticking all the you know things on it, see how your heart's going and what have you. And he helped me with my diet and told me what to eat and also told me to rest 20 minutes every four hours and go on, which I actually didn't do. But he convinced me uh, it had been John, I think it was Dick Poole, one of the riders had gone straight through without sleep. So straight away looking at Albert Crime's times, I knew he'd had two lumps of sleep, so I thought, right, I'm going to ride through without any sleep or had the minimum, and we talk about the minimum, and the minimum was 15 minutes, mm. and uh, Keith Edwards lent me his uh, uh, Dormerville, and what happened was, that when I got near Preston, I began to feel a bit drowsy, I got in the back and just lay down for 10 minutes, and that was it, and they woke me up, and I got back on again, and I had the same thing uh, when I got near Inverness, actually, I, they'd gone ahead, I lay in the road and just put my feet up on the trike and just had 10 minutes there, <laughs> so uh, that, that was probably the first tricyclist to go through without what I call proper sleep. And the other thing which I did too was I uh, looked at Albert Crime's gear ratios and he got a very a, a very short ratio, he hadn't got a very big top gear and he got quite a high bottom gear and uh, so I had a, a bigger spread of, of gears on my bike uh, trike and also uh, for instance I rode Berrydale which the, the, they don't go over Berrydale now like we used to do and Albert Crimes had walked Berrydale so I rode, rode Berrydale and I looked for places where I could, could, could get over his record yeah. by going through without the sleep, by going, you know, by having better gear ratio and the, ra the ride only eventful thing happened when, near Wolverhampton when my shoe plate broke on, on, on my shoes and I had to change to another pair of shoes that hadn't got, they, they weren't right, they weren't my proper racing shoes. And so somebody went ahead with, with my shoes and found Percy Stallard, knocked up his shop and then first on the side of the road put in shoe plates on my shoes so I could go back to my proper shoes. <laughs> I had those back again. Um, and the same thing, I rotated all my, my friends who were driving the car looking after me on the way up and um, uh, nothing, nothing terrible happened. It was just that it, it, it hurts. It's a long way, and towards mm. the end, you really are, you know, riding into the unknown. And um, but for th three months after, I couldn't feel my fingers; they'd all gone numb uh, because of the pressure on the handlebars. Yeah. Uh, but uh, no, there was nothing overly dramatic. Dave, you, you seem to have a, a tremendously varied life, as a lot of cyclists have. Actually, you've been in the trade. 
you've done some very successful things riding bicycles and tricycles, um, worked for most of the major firms and done your commentary work. And what about this, this other part of your life, the consultancy, helping other people out with products and so forth? It came about really, uh, John, when um, my commentary work was intruding on my work at Halfords. I'd mm -hmm. been there seven years. We'd done uh, many things in the time I was there. And I was going off on things like the, the Kellogg's Pro Tour, the Nissan Classic, um, doing city centre cycle racing for Alan Rushton. And in addition, there was just opening a, a company called Screen Sport that were going to be uh, first in the field with sport on uh, on satellite TV and, and down the uh, down the, the cables. So I thought the time was to move on, really. Mm -hmm. I'd um, got to a point in half as well as repeating what I'd been doing before. And part of that, cause they were trying to take some of the marketing off me and wanted me only in charge of buying. Uh, and they were trying to revamp the company and go to a lot younger blood. And so I talked to the, um, the mar marketing merchandise director about it. And what we agreed was that I would leave the company with a three-year contract as a consultant to them. Um, and that I would then go off and do my own thing. And I, I had a very good contract. At the same time, BH, the, the biggest mask manufacturer in Spain, had been uh, supplying Halfords. And they were trying to open up in other outlets, namely through factors selling their kids' bikes and so on. So so I got a contract from them, and although Bianchi, the biggest bicycle company in Italy, were partly in competition with BH, they weren't because they were looking top end sports bikes from Bianchi, and a company that um, was in, in Warwick, who I knew quite well, they were just starting out with Bianchi bikes, so they also gave me a contract to work for them. So I had a number of things to do as I left Halfords to occupy my time and give me some income. Uh, the commentary work continued to grow quite a good pace, and over the three years I worked for those respective companies. And then uh, the, the consultancies, those particular ones, ceased. And what I was finding then, as the commentary work started to come on board for, for Eurosport, I was working very quite hard in the summer, in fact it's increased all the more now, but in the winter there's still that gap, because mm. cycle racing finished in those days, round about end of September, now we're into October with the World Track Championships and one or two things, and we were not restarting until about April, the, the uh, Milan San Remo's end of March, but that meant I'd got sort of uh, October, November, December, January, February, March, I got virtually nearly six months of nothing. And as I'd had this experience in helping people with their projects, I looked around for other companies to work for. I had a short period with uh, Falk and Claude Butler where I was more or less fully employed with them, looking after first of all their bike rack business and then looking after the national accounts. And this is where my consultancy came most of all. Uh, the dealing with mail order, dealing with Halfords, dealing with the big multiple buyers is a very different business from dealing with ordinary cycle dealers. Mm. So my consultancy then moved round f for the looking after the big buyers, which is mainly a winter business, because mail order, they'll do their selections in round about the September, October, November period. They want samples, they want prices, then in January they want the specifications writing. And when they come to do the next reselection in June, we went doing the Tour of Italy at that time for Eurosport, it meant in June I could also then look after the next spring-summer selections. So almost by accident this gap opened up in, in my business career, so I started to look after the, the big national accounts for people like, well, um, Muddy Fox for instance, they asked me to come on board to help them, so I helped them with national accounts, and also Muddy Fox, who had at that time uh, gone into liquidation and reformed. Uh, I launched a, a range called Silver Fox Form, did every specifications, colours, graphics, catalogues and everything else. Uh, and I was working sometimes two days a week for them, plus this, this work in the winter. So I could offer, and can still offer if I wish to do it, um, either the entree into big buyers, or I could help people with their uh, marketing, advertising, uh, catalogues, print and, and publicity, that sort of thing. Uh, and that's been very good because once the Muddy Fox thing went, uh, they were happy with what they were doing, they took over it, what they were doing. Because what happens, you start a consultant, you can feed in the people that work for the company to do the job for you. Mm. And for them. Now, after uh, Muddy Fox, I did this consultancy work for Alan, Alex Moulton on the APB with Pashley. Again, that was mainly the winter. It just worked out perfectly. They'd gone through a number of changes. They wanted things doing, so I worked the winter for them. Um, and then I went and did a couple of years, if not longer, with, with Peugeot, doing the same thing, looking after their national accounts, because again, uh, Eddie Eccleston left the company, uh, and the lady who took over. 
was good on administration but knew nothing about marketing. She had some people help her on the dealer side but nothing on the national account side. And as I uh, knew Brian Montgomery was part of the Cycle Europe people in Paris and got to hear about this and also I could go to the factory in, in, uh, near Paris because I was working a lot there too, it dovetailed in very well mm. with that company. So along the way it's been almost fortuitous but I've been looking for opportunities. When, you, when these gaps open up you have to search around to say hey mm. I'm here, you know, I can help you. And it was probably fortuitous. It's, I've been able to help in that to, that way, uh, but it's it's virtually stopped now. Uh, I'm just uh, look after a little one or two things for Alex. Helped him with the launch of the new series and helped him with the, his his catalogue of that one, uh, and helped him a bit on the PR and how to write his press releases. Because I still like to be involved in the industry, but the situation now is I've only virtually got November and December because with the racing starting down in Australia in January, I don't have the time to work for big accounts any longer during that winter period. So I can stay now, at this time of my life, that virtually that's just gone. But it's not to say the phone doesn't ring and somebody says, come and do a job for me. Like, I had a one-off job uh, to do, which is going to lead to something else. A, a, another Spanish company uh, wanted to come into the UK market. In fact, this, this made me have one bad winter. Uh, they spoke to me, the, the man who got the agency for the UK. I did a full report for them. I spent a lot of time uh, showing them how to do a full document, everything, market, margins, how to do the whole shooting match, dealers, range, the whole shooting match. Never got paid for it. And all I kept saying, yes, well, the checks in the post, we want you to work full time for us, we, this is going on. When you're self employed, you do get let down sometime. I was working for a company doing uh, rallies for one period after uh, the screen sport folding before Eurosport fully got up steam. I was going to do 11 national, uh, international road rallies with the camera crew because I'm very interested in cars, particularly rallying. And that company went bust only four grand. So, you, and I've been not paid by other people from time to time. So, mm -hmm. when you're self employed, you do have a few hiccups, but uh, I prefer to be about my own, although as I say now it's mainly Eurosports, working for Alan Rushton, working for Tour Down Under, and helping Alex Morton from time to time when he just wants somebody to talk to. Mm. Are, there, are there any things that you haven't done that you feel you would like to do? I mean, like to do. You've, you've done a tremendous amount of different things in, the, in cycling. Um, is there anything that you, you haven't done or you think you might like to have done? Not really. I've had you know, a wonderful opportunity to do many things which have interested me at that time. There is one thing I would like to do, in fact I've already mapped it out. Uh, I think this country needs a, a damn good single day classic. And I've worked out why Alan Rushton's classics failed. Uh, not because I think he did, it's because of the way in which sponsorship changed and the way in which the courses couldn't be run effectively. And I've already plotted a course that could do a very good special single day classic. Uh, and I know what sort of sponsorship I want and I know how to get on television. And I'd like to think that if I could uh, later in my life now put together a race which went on in perpetuity because it had something about it which was appealing to the public and television, then at least I've done something that I haven't done before. I've, I've organised and been involved in races, uh, but not from the point of view of promoting one from scratch. Mm. And I think it'd be nice to do something like that. Um, that's the only, not the only, that's a challenge I've got left if I can get, get I've got to get the time though, it's, it's yeah. find the time to do it, John. Yeah. So I may, it may happen a long time down the road, but uh, I've worked very hard at it mentally so far, and I think it's quite feasible. Are there any things that you haven't done in your life? Are there any places you haven't been? Have you got any regrets? about your life? I look back at, for instance, the Pembroke London record, which I tried twice and didn't get, and I, I would like to have got that. I don't like failure, and for one reason I, I didn't actually get that one. Um, and that, in, in sporting arena, was something I was, I was sad about. But uh, other than that, John, no, I've been very lucky, and um, I, you know, I've still got certain things I want to do in the future, and I think it's been, I've been very fortunate in everything I've done so far. I, it's, I can look back at it and say, hey, that was, that was great, I enjoyed that, and it seems to work. I think, I think in some of your top David, there's only so much that we can contribute from our lives and I think that the contribution that you've made from your life has been quite memorable in so many different ways and, and I feel it an honour to have been able to talk to you about this and I'd like to thank you very, very much for that ability uh, and that opportunity. We've, uh, we've certainly enjoyed being with you today. Thank you, John. It's very nice having you down here. Anyway, I hope we go on scenes for a long time yeah. yet to come. <laughs> Absolutely.